starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, hello everybody, and um, thank you for joining us. Um, we're just seeing how many people are joining us. Uh, yesterday, we had had 146 people registered to join us from uh, some 60 organizations in 39 countries. So that's a, a fantastic attendance, and um, hopefully more people will join us as we get going. Um, We've got a mix of people from all sorts of types of organizations, from UN, government, Red Cross, NGOs, universities, and academic uh, institutions, as well as individual consultants. Um, over half of you said you hadn't used systematic reviews in your work yet, but less than 1% of you said you didn't use research. So hopefully you're in a good place for, for taking research seriously. to close uh, by four o'clock British summer time, so about 90 minutes from now. And you should be receiving instructions on how to send us questions via the chat box function in the webinar panel. Please feel free to send us questions at any time. Um, we're gonna, we've got people here who are gonna be collating them and then we'll be attempting to get, them through, get through as many of those questions as possible by the end of the session. We are recording today's session so that other people not able to join us at this time can listen to it in the future. My name is Nigel Timmins. I'm uh, Oxfam's Humanitarian Director. Um, and by way of introduction to the Humanitarian Evidence Programme, we're a partnership between Oxfam and the Feinstein International Centre at the Friedman School of Nutrition, part of Tufts University. And we've been funded by DFID through their Humanitarian The program team comprises of Colette Fearham, uh, Deputy Humanitarian Director in Oxfam, Liz Stites, Program Director for Feinstein, Roxani Cristali, Program Manager at Tufts, and Lisa Wormsley, the Program and Communications Manager here at Oxfam. Working with over 30 authors and researchers, we've systematically searched the evidence base in response to eight key questions relating to humanitarian interventions and approaches. And we've critically appraised and synthesized around 250 individual pieces of research, academic as well as grey literature, reports and evaluations. And we hope that this will together provide a synthesis of the best available research evidence on the influence and impact of key humanitarian approaches and interventions, essentially what works, as well as a clear indication of the evidence gaps and some recommendations about potential future ways to address these. These outputs were published in the form of eight systematic reviews and evidence briefs earlier this year. So this is the first of a series of four webinars that we'll be holding between now and the 26th of October. Today's topic is what works in mental health and child protection interventions. So I'm delighted to be joined on the panel by both Kelly Dixon and Mukhtarak Bangpam, uh, both mental health psychosocial systematic review authors and researchers at EPI Centre, part of University College London. 
And we're also joined by Catherine Williamson, uh, Senior Humanitarian Child Protection Advisor for Save the Children UK and lead author of the systematic review on unaccompanied and separated children. And we're also joined online by Catherine's co-authors, Harry Shannon, Professor Emeritus at Macassar University in Ontario, and Priya Gupta, also at Macassar University, who provided research assistance on the project. So thank you very much all for joining us in your various time zones. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us all. So I'll, I'll draw to a close there, um, but basically hand over for um, some context and findings from the two reviews um, before moving to a group discussion. So Catherine, if I could hand over to you to share the key findings of the child protection evidence synthesis. Thanks, Nigel. Hello, everyone. So the question that we sought to answer in the systematic review um, on unaccompanied and separated children is what is the impact of protection interventions on unaccompanied and separated children during the period of separation in humanitarian crises in low and middle income countries? So we thought this topic was important to practitioners because unaccompanied and separated children are considered to be amongst the most vulnerable children in humanitarian crises, having lost the care and protection of their usual caregivers. We decided to focus on the period of separation as this is the time that they are arguably at their most vulnerable. We also decided to focus on low and middle income countries in order that the review is not overwhelmed with evidence from about unaccompanied separated children arriving in higher income countries. So we know that the identification of unaccompanied separated children, the provision of adequate interim care and support to family tracing and response, and response to other immediate needs is a life-saving intervention. It's therefore critical that we are learning about how to get this right. So the systematic review provides the starting point for defining what we know about what works with unaccompanied separated children and it provides an indication of what more we need to know. It doesn't, it doesn't represent the whole, whole body of knowledge. It was conducted in liaison with the Interagency Working Group on Unaccompanied and Separated Children which is the main coordination mechanism for humanitarian agencies working with, with this group of children. So, um, so um, if you look at the, the table that we have here, we try to break down uh, the different sort of interventions that, that are um, conducted with unaccompanied and separated children in humanitarian context into categories, domains of intervention, we call them. So the child protection, so uh, essentially that this, this fell into two sort of uh, domains of intervention and two subdomains of, of the first one. The first one is about child protection um, and uh, activities that are specific to the needs of unaccompanied and separated children. So these are things such as interim care and family tracing, which are aimed at restoring a protective environment. We also looked at general child protection interventions that may include unaccompanied and separated children, um, aimed at protecting them from abuse, exploitation, violence and neglect, such as the prevention of or response to sexual violence. And then a second domain was looking at the mental health and psychosocial support interventions with unaccompanied and separated children. So if we go to the next slide, um, in summary, to summarise the sort of full, the extent of the evidence of uh, 5,535 records identified, 23, um, following two screenings, 23 met eligibility criteria. So two of these were qualitative studies, nine were quantitative, and 14 focused on family tracing and reunification, which were also quantitative, but with a, a different eligibility criteria. Nine of the studies were published and 14 were grey literature. And if we go to the next slide, we can look at how, where those studies fell within the, the domains of intervention. So of the 23 studies, two looked at both interim care and family tracing, and one study contained multiple case studies. That's why the numbers don't quite, quite add up. Um, when, we, when we break that down to the domains of intervention previously outlined, we had 14 studies, including 17 case studies, focused on family tracing and reunification. Um, and of these, 15 of the case studies were in conflict, including six which were in post-genocide Rwanda and the surrounding region. Only two were conducted in disasters. 13 were set in Africa, two in Asia, one in Latin America, and one in the Middle East. So nine studies focused on interim care. Eight of these were in conflict in Africa, and one in a natural disaster in post-tsunami Aceh. 
Um, and two studies focused on mental health and psychosocial support with unaccompanied and separated children, one in Rwanda and one in, in Haiti. So in all of those domains, the median quality of the studies was low to medium. So what we have is a limited number of studies of relatively low quality, heavily skewed towards programs with unaccompanied separated children in conflicts in Africa. So if we go to the next slide, we, can, we have a summary of the key findings. In relation to family safety and reunification, what we find is uh, this is the area which has the most extensive evidence there. Um, in other relatively comparable protracted regional conflicts, caseloads of unaccompanied separated children tended to be around the 20,000 mark. Um, in Rwanda, the caseload was 120,000, so it's completely unprecedented. Um, it's also the most studied context, so six of the 14 case studies, or 17, no, 14 FTR case studies, and it led to the development of many of the family tracing and reunification approaches that are still used today. It also led to the formation of the interagency working group in order to support a coordinated response and common working principles between agencies, and it prompted the development of the guiding principles for working with unaccompanied and separated children. It therefore shaped the way in which we respond to separation to this day, which then has some implications for non-conflict and displacement approaches. Um, the vast majority of evidence comes from conflicts. So evidence from uh, post-tsunami Ache actually indicates that uh, lower rates of separation in that context. And it, demonstrate, it sort of demonstrated that the separation was localized and mainly resolved, although it was extensive, it was mainly resolved through community networks in the early days of the crisis before humanitarian actors actually got on the ground. Um, there is no evidence, however, of separation in slow onset crises, so that remains a sort of gap. So factors that influence the rates of reunification um, are effective coordination between UN, NGOs, civil society organizations and governments engagement with communities in the identification, tracing and reunification process, capacity building is integral to program, programming and systems building, simple effective systems of information management and exchange, and adequate sustained program funding. So those are, those are all quite intuitive, I think, to practitioners as well. Age and gender desegregation were not routinely done. However, a number of F, uh, family tracing reunification studies raised concerns about missing girls. This was most apparent in programs aimed at the release and reintegration of children associated with armed forces and armed groups, but was also evident in other programs, including post-tsunami Aceh uh, and Rwanda. It's not clear whether low uh, numbers of girls relate to prevalence of separation or to poor identification of girls, but we need to explore the underlying reasons. Um, so for interim care, the outcomes for children uh, living in, in residential care were mixed. Where positive outcomes were achieved, this was linked to a focus on investment in increasing the child caregiver ratio and a focus on the quality of the child caregiver relationship. Um, factors which are often not often not in place there. Um, outcomes for children in foster care were generally but not consistently positive. Study outcomes indicated that significant ongoing monitoring and support to both children and families is required to ensure that foster care is effective for all children. Um, and it's not just a case of prioritizing one foster care over residential care, but of ensuring the quality of programming necessary to get it right. Um, so we also found that to evaluate the outcomes for children, uh, we developed a measure that examined the physical, emotional, intellectual, social aspects of the adequacy of care, as well as whether interim care was appropriate for the child. But no studies looked at outcomes from all these dimensions, and very few considered the cultural validity of the approach to evaluation. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll just look at the findings on mental health and psychosocial support. There were only two studies that looked at mental health and psychosocial support for unaccompanied separated children, and both indicated some positive impacts of the intervention. However, both were of low to medium quality, and so it's impossible to draw any meaningful conclusions other than that there is a lack of evidence. Both studies use externally conceptualized models of how to promote psychosocial well-being and applied these to unaccompanied and separated children in residential care. Neither looked at the mental health and psychosocial needs specific to unaccompanied and separated children, for example, the impact of broken attachment, loss and grief on children's emotional well-being. Um, and the indicators of well-being and measures used to evaluate them were also external and lacked cultural validity. 
So whilst a lack of evidence does not mean a lack of practice, as a practitioner, my sense is that in this case it does. And my key, key takeaway from this study is that more needs to be done to promote the mental health and psychosocial well-being of unaccompanied and separated children in culturally appropriate ways. And this has been a key takeaway from this work that's gaining traction amongst humanitarian agencies. Thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed, Catherine. Um, that's really helpful. So now I think we're going to turn to Kelly to present the findings of the, the mental health evidence synthesis. Uh, and then after that, we'll go to um, different questions. So Kelly, can I hand over to you? Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Nigel. Um, well, we conducted a scoping exercise to identify systematic reviews on mental health and psychosocial programmes, also for people affected by humanitarian emergencies. Um, this informed our decision to ask two main questions in the review. The first one on the barriers and facilitators of, implement, of implementing and receiving programmes, uh, mainly looking at qualitative data. The second, we looked at quantitative data on the effects of those programmes. Programs. We then aim to bring those findings from each of those two synthesis together to answer a third question, which would look at the key features of effective mental health and psychosocial programs. On the next slide, um, so we did we undertook extensive searching and screening for eligible studies to answer the review question. Um, from that process, we, identi we identified 13 qualitative studies on barriers and facilitators, which would, could be included in the thematic synthesis, and 49 quantitative studies on impact of programmes, which we included in the meta-analysis. All the studies were from low middle income countries. So from that, we found that the concentration of evidence is conducted in armed conflict settings. This was for both children and adults. Um, programs for children were majority group based, while the programs for adults were more likely to be one to one formats. Um, the longest programs were around three, three months. Um, some of the studies also evaluated uh, gender specific MHS programs, but this was but this wasn't very many. So if we look at the effects of MHS programmes for children and young people, we were able to include 26 RCTs in the synthesis. Um, overall, the programmes for MHPSS programmes can improve, we found that they can improve PTSD symptoms, functional impairment and conduct problems. However, they are less likely to have an impact on depression, anxiety or pro-social behaviours. This was for the majority, this was when we looked at all MHS, MHPSS programmes. Next slide please, next two slides I think. Thank you. Um, so we decided to break down the mental health and psychosocial programs by type of program for children and young people. This revealed a different picture on the outcomes. Um, so we found that cognitive behavioural therapy can improve PTSD and depression symptoms, but may have no impact on anxiety or pro-social behaviours. Whereas narrative exposure therapy can improve functioning, but may have little impact on PTSD. Whereas psychosocial interventions can often increase depression symptoms. So for adults, we were able to include 20 RCTs in the meta-analysis. Um, 17 of the trials assessed the impact of, of programmes on PTSD, 12 on depression and 6 on anxiety. Um, overall, we observed a positive trend of programmes on PTSD, depression and anxiety. Thank you. So moving to the qualitative evidence synthesis, we looked at 13 studies, um, the majority of which, as I said, included um, qualitative evidence on people, on providers and recipients' views. And we were able to generate five themes from these studies. The, what we found was, is that community engagement was a key mechanism supporting the greater accessibility and reach of programmes. We also found that programmes to be delivered effectively need to have sufficient numbers of trained providers um, to ensure that they are able to deliver all the programme 
elements as intended. Um, recipients also talked about the need for programmes to be both socially and culturally meaningful um, to ensure that they remain uh, appealing to them um, and also speak to them. Um, some programme recipients, particularly women, also talked about the importance of group-based programmes for reducing uh, social isolation and increasing community cohesion. Um, we also found that um, trusting and supportive relationships with programme providers were said to help maximise their engagement and enjoyment of mental health and psychosocial programmes. Okay. You, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, that that's the that's the findings from there. We can answer more questions. If you have them, but yeah. Great. So that's, okay. Thank you very much, um, Kelly. Um, good. So I guess the key theme of the the humanity and evidence program has been to try and synthesise existing evidence, both for future research but also for informing the work of, of practitioners on the ground in humanitarian crises. Um, so I wonder, you know, for both yourself, Kelly and, and, and Catherine, it'd be great to hear you know, some illustrations of good practice or successful interventions that you saw in each of your two studies. And Kelly, could you kick us off and then Catherine? Hi, that's Mukhtarab speaking now um, on MHPSS and reviews. Based on the, our review evidence base, uh, I feel that it's very important questions. Um, I just can hear, I uh, heard from Kelly that we uh, had conduct um, two synthesis, one on quantitative synthesis, one on qualitative synthesis. At the last exercise, we, br we brought together the finding from these two synthesis, which helps us to understand further about the key features of effective MHPSS programs, in particular to children and young people. So in this context, um, that is evident from our analysis to, to suggest that it might be helpful for when designing or implementing the program to consider the importance of building trust and developing partnerships between program providers and program recipients, as this would maximize participant engagement in the program. Another consideration is about having sufficient number of trained providers. This might in fact pose some challenges in, um, in human training setting in terms of recruiting and retaining the trained staff. Lastly, we think from our finding from the meta regressions, the evidence suggests that the programs that are socially and culturally meaningful to local populations might be effective in improving depression in young people. People. So from, from our review, we identified three key features of effective MHPSS program based on our finding that might be a starting point, if you like, when you're implementing and designing the programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mukhtar. I wonder, could you say just a bit more about how you build trust? I mean, it's easy to say, difficult to do in practice. Did you have any really good examples of, of how people build trust in practical terms? Yes, I can I can give a quick example and Kelly might add more. In terms of building trust in the children in particular, uh, we found that um, working with parents and family level is very important to make sure that children um, have time and willing to participate in the program, which is um, have them engage and detaining in the programs. So the one examples that um, we found in our um, findings and in term also in terms of community engagement as well involving in the community grassroots at the local level would help um, the program implemented um, facilitating um, the program implementations Kelly you want to add something 
Hi, yeah, so some of the studies, particularly again, this was a, a feature for children and um, young people, was about program providers really sort of understanding that there is a power dynamic between children and people. So they often uh, wanted to deliver programs in settings that felt more comfortable to them. So maybe um, what they called safe settings, but they didn't always particularly describe what that meant, but it could be in their homes or anywhere where the young person uh, wanted to to um, have um, support. Um. Okay, thanks, thank you. And, and Catherine, what about in your study, you know, some of the good practice based, you know, in the field? Sure. I mean, something I should emphasize is the majority of robust studies were, were quite dated. I think, um, you know, we should, we should obviously encourage um, practitioners academics to be to be producing more more recent uh, studies um, something to pick out uh, Richardson a 2003 study um, Do Richardson documented an effective regional response to separation across the Manor River region um, and the family and uh, documented why family tracing works so well there. So the systems work well because of the high quality training of government workers, staff, children and community members, uh, because of good coordination between agencies and government authorities for awareness raising and policy formation, and because of the consistent comprehensive exchange of information across the region. Um, and that program, the Sub-Regional Separated Children's Program, evolved into a program to protect all children, not just separated children. Um, so, for example, in Sierra Leone, the separated children's database was housed within the Ministry of Social Welfare and Gender and Children's Affairs and increased awareness of child sexual abuse as an endemic issue. So this was one part of a broader uh, program, a re really good example of systems building uh, using unaccompanied separated children as, as an entry point for that. And I think it remains uh, quite a gold standard program in many ways. Um, other ones of note, uh, I thought uh, uh, Merkel Match in t the year 2000 examined the extent to which the ICRC database supported family tracing and reunification in post-genocide Rwanda. And for me, I raised that one because it remains relevant as the sector grapples with how we use information management systems and digitalization and uh, the, the place of that within uh, work with unaccompanied separated children. So the key learning was that the database didn't assist matching and reunification in the first phase of the response, uh, but was effective in matching difficult to trace cases and those separated across borders during, during the period of continued displacement. Um, so it facilitated that information exchange again. Um, in terms of interim care, I thought uh, one that I that I particularly liked, again, quite dated, is two, from 2001, Derib, um, documented uh, a rare example of a relatively well-documented program evaluation of a type of foster care developed for South Sudanese children in refugee camps in Kenya and Ethiopia called family attachment care. Um, so and this was developed as an alternative to group care and the outcomes of that were generally positive but again did highlight the need for adequate follow-up and support and to increase that because whilst most children sort of greatly benefited, significantly benefited from that intervention and the move towards family-based care, some, not, not all children developed a good relationship with their caregiver and that, that needed monitoring and support to ensure that that was um, addressed. So I think those are just a few to highlight. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so colleagues online, please do send um, questions so we can get a bit of a discussion going here because um, there's some really interesting findings. So please do pin your questions through in the, in the chat box on the side. Um, Catherine, I'm, I'm conscious that you know, another issue was particularly around um, targeting um, and you were sort of concerned about the issue of, of missing girls. I wonder, could you say a little bit more about how child protection interventions have been targeted um, and you know what you observe there? Sure, um, as I touched on before, I mean it was quite striking that disaggregation is not systematically done, which then limits of, of case information, um, which limits the extent to which programs can be targeted. Um, and where gender was disaggregated, family tracing studies noted a lower proportion of girls and boys. So that was most consistently evident in, in relation to children associated with armed forces and armed groups. Uh, so in Sierra Leone, 8.5% of children demobilized were girls, but this number fails to reflect the sig significant number of girls who were abducted by the Revolutionary, Revolutionary United Front at the time. Um, and similarly, Richardson reports a gender and balancing girls aged between 13 to 18 in Sierra Leone and Liberia. So that indicates a hidden population of separated girls, including those associated with armed groups who came to be known as the lost girls. 
Um, and, and it's thought that the fear of stigmatization is the key reason my girls felt unable to return home. Um, but the issue of gender imbalance is also seen amongst displaced and accompanied separated children in the Great Lakes region following the Rwand Rwandan genocide and in Aceh following the tsunami as well. So of itself, it may indicate that fewer girls are separated or that fewer separated girls are identified. But without investigating the root causes of this, it, it's really hard to know. So we need to have that disaggregation in order that we, we understand uh, the sort of... Um, profile of separated children but also start to identify groups who who are not being reached and certainly the authors of several studies considered it a cause for concern and just I think also in terms of targeting another key point to highlight relates to the mental health and psychosocial support because they're not targeted at the needs of unaccompanied separated children this raises concerns that those children are not being adequately supported and that their outcomes their life outcomes and the sustainability of their care may therefore be at risk Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, good, and, and Kelly or Muktawas, I mean, what were your thoughts and findings around the um, targeting and, and aspects of gender and the way mental health programs were, were implemented? Okay, um, from our review, overall, we, uh, we think we um, we is like evidence based in terms of gender specific MHPSS program for children. We identify only two um, study focus on girls and one on boys. Although we look further for children study, we identify eight study that discuss or do some kind of subgroups into um, analysis and report by outcome the outcomes by gender. Overall, the findings are quite mixed. That means we, we could not uh, identify clear pattern across types of intervention or outcomes. For example, one study found that interpersonal therapy in groups uh, was effective in girls, but not for boys. In the same study, they also um, look at uh, the trend between girls and boys on create creative play, but they found no difference between these two groups of population. Another study found that CBT school-based intervention in contrast were more, you know, effective on girls than boys on psychosocial behaviors. And another two study in our review also report unintended impact of intervention on young girls. So overall, it's got a mixed message across, you know, uh, different types of interventions and outcomes. So we cannot confirm any pattern on this um, effectiveness of MHPSS programs. Thank you. I guess, you know, Sorry, Sorry, it's just Kelly here. Um, there's two of us. So, so just to say that for adults, we didn't find any um, clear indication on outcomes, either dis uh, disaggregated by uh, gender. But in the for the studies of qualitative evidence, there was some indication that when uh, women have experienced sexual violence, the programs need to need to. Uh, uh, target specifically and you know sort of deliver to women only and not have not have mixed groups so I just wanted to add that but the data is very thin for adults in terms of gender okay thank you I mean, well I mean building on that sort of question around evidence I suppose um, I mean you know one of the key findings was around working out what the gaps in the evidence base are and what the opportunities for further evidence generation are. Um, could you share a few thoughts on, on those areas from each of the respective reviews, again, where you feel there's a need for more uh, and better evidence? Catherine, do you want to kick us off? Sure, thanks. Um, in terms of family tracing reunification, I think the, the first point I would make is uh, that we should take the opportunity to more systematically analyse case management information. Um, and I say that knowing as a practitioner, I'm so sorry, uh, but, uh, um, how difficult that actually is. But uh, where we have that opportunity, uh, in, or in order that we understand which children, girls, boys, different age groups have been identified as separated for what reason, um, 
we should I mean I should note that case management information is not necessarily an indicator of prevalence or separation of separation but rather of which unaccompanied separated children have been identified but it does remain a, a rich source of information that, that we should be um, analyzing and taking more advantage of to build that picture um, when compared across contexts, this should help help us to build a picture of who is vulnerable to separation in different humanitarian contexts and why. It will also help to indicate missing groups such as girls or ethnic minorities who are not being reached. Um, it would complement recent research that's been conducted to measure the nature and scale of separation through measuring prevalence rates in, in Democratic Republic of Congo and Haiti. Um, and we need to continue to generate prevalence data in different types of humanitarian contexts such as natural disasters and slow onset emergencies. And this is important because as a sector, when a crisis hits, we are keen to be able to say that in this context, given the type and scale of the emergency and ABC variables, it's likely that X amount of children are separated. And this will help us to leverage funding for life-saving interventions in the early days of a sudden onset emergency. Um, we should also ensure as good practice that we're not equating reunification with the child's best interest by just monitoring your reunification rates, but monitoring how many children achieve long term solutions in their best interest, including reunification. So global indicators are being developed to, to this effect through the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. Uh, for interim care, whilst the evidence is not enough to validate the prioritisation of family based care over residential care in humanitarian contexts, the evidence from non humanitarian settings is robust and it is applicable uh, so we shouldn't sort of um, disregard that norm uh, it's important that we're continuing to learn about what factors are essential for positive outcomes for children in formal and informal foster care given how rapidly we need to scale up care systems in many contexts so think about Bangladesh right now uh, where appropriate we should catch, compare outcomes for children in foster care with those in residential care but this shouldn't hinder efforts to ensure that children are in family-based care the, the lack of, I apologise for the background noise, I came to the quietest place in the office but the noise followed unfortunately. Um, so the lack of a standard framework for evaluating outcomes of care interventions for unaccompanied separated ch children in humanitarian contexts was also notable. We developed our own framework against which to evaluate the evaluators and it was based on the international definitions of adequate so the physical, intellectual, emotional, social dimensions and of appropriate care whether the quality of the child and caregiver relationship is appropriate to needs. So I would suggest a standard framework would help to compare across contexts whilst enabling contextual adaptation and addition. Um, if we move to unaccompanied and separated children. Oh, uh, so if I were to pick one priority for further research, it would be to develop evidence on effective mental health and psychosocial interventions with unaccompanied. Can I just, sorry, I'll just, uh, one, one second. Sorry, so, uh, so it would be to develop evidence on the effective mental health and psychosocial interventions with unaccompanied separated children. So, and perhaps this is a point where our two presentations converge and I hope concur. However, any research would be predicated on the existence of the programming with unaccompanied and separated children. And it's my view that that's, that's quite lacking. Um, I may be, I'd love to be proved wrong, so, so please do. Um, therefore, the evaluation of that has to go hand in hand with developing and implementing program approaches. And in my mind, it's not about defining or rolling out MHPSS interventions separately from unaccompanied and separated children's programming, but about ensuring that those social workers and case workers who have the direct contact with children and families and foster carers understand the impact of separation on the mental health and psychosocial well-being of children. They're able to recognize and respond appropriately to those children and are able to advise and support caregivers on how to meet the emotional needs of these children and address behavioral issues. Thank you. Kelly or Mutra, what are your thoughts about? Well, I just want to well, I just want to second what Catherine says, and it isn't actually on my slide here, but I think what she's and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, you know, the need for integrated services, so not separating out the needs in mental health and psychosocial needs separately from other interventions because you know our physical and mental health are so intertwined. Um my uh our slide here on the gap sort of is a bit of a wish list. Um so 
we found that there was a lack of um, evaluations of basic services and security programs. So the interagency standing committee tier tier one, we still don't find um, any uh, trials or process evaluations in this area. Um, similarly, programs in natural disaster settings, while there are some, it's much, much less than armed conflict settings. Um, also, uh, programs delivered immediately after disasters is also quite thin on the ground, particularly psychological first aid um, delivered in low middle income countries, I should add there. Um, also, you know, we had two um, syntheses, one on uh, the process evaluations, looking at implementation and receipt, and one on effects, and they didn't really speak to each other very well in the sense that they were looking at very different types of uh, programs. So we would really like to see um, qualitative process evaluations being conducted alongside evaluations of impacts to look at things like the role of in community engagement, trained providers, um, cost effectiveness data, and also the overall fidelity of program delivery and what impact that might have to explain the differential impacts that we found. Um, also, you know, psychosocial outcomes are lacking, so the focus is still on uh, uh, PTSD um, rather than issues such as resilience, coping and social support and there is a real gap around substance misuse and, and suicidal ideation. Um, the, there is a lack of, there is also a lack of longer term follow-up so I think at the most three months um, um, at the, no, at the very most a year, but that was very, very rare. I'm just looking at McGrath to confirm this. Um, and we don't have any studies about programs at scale. Um, and as we touched on earlier, uh, more disaggregation in the analysis according to gender and age and the relationship between the two um, would also be welcomed. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I've got a, a question here actually for, for you, um, I imagine Kelly or, or, or Mokdra, whoever prefers to pick it up. Is, did you find in your experience any social or cultural obstacles to embracing psychosocial support in communities? For, for example, was the service ever seen as implying there was something wrong with the child? Is there a stigma or resistance towards receiving mental health services? And, and if that was the case, how was it overcome? Well, the, one of the key findings from the process evaluations was the need for mental health and um, uh, sort of programs to reduce mental health stigma. But we didn't find that this was a key feature of programs in the trials. So while it's identified as an issue for implementation, um, reducing mental health stigma, we didn't we didn't see it as particularly interest uh, focused on in the evaluations of outcomes. Okay, all right, thank you. And a um, que uh, question here, I think probably more for you, Catherine, um, is how to move beyond the model of child-friendly spaces in terms of, of mental health and psychosocial support interventions for children in conflict settings? Great question. It's one of my favourite topics. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I think uh, you know that child friendly spaces uh, definitely have uh, have their place, um, and that, is that they are actually one of the approaches that have, do have an emerging evidence base. Um, uh, just I would refer people to the World Vision and Columbia University led uh, um, three year research in six countries, uh, which looked at the psychosocial and child protection outcomes of child friendly spaces, uh, which demonstrated. Um, some psychosocial and, child and, and protective outcomes, um, but variable and uh, indicated variable and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, but to, to get back to the the key question, what the alternatives are, I think uh, that that is um, that uh, child friendly spaces are one entry point, and they can be an effective entry point, particularly in the context of displacement. There are other entry points. We should be looking at uh, how we reach children through schools and education, how we ensure that teachers are trained and that there are psychosocial supports that staff, uh, ideally, within schools. Um, 
looking at how we increase our uh, provision of, of mental health services through through health as well and making sure that these these uh, different areas are linked together um, so that you have again I think uh, child protection case management is, is an effective way of ensuring that that one child one family is supported uh, within the school environment and supported to access health and so on um, there, I think there are there are many other mental health psychosocial support very uh, innovative examples of innovative practices is coming out in, uh, in different places, particularly the Middle East, um, but uh, I won't go into too much detail. Well, I, I, interestingly, I mean, some of the participants are asking what these programs actually look like. So maybe if you could actually just describe them specifically, what do these interventions or child protection interventions look like in, in practical terms? I think people, so feel free to go into the detail. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, so for the mental health I'm not, I have to just uh, state that I'm not a mental health practitioner, so I'm a child protection practitioner. In terms of psychosocial support, I think very much as uh, as as I have said, I think uh, some work that Save the Children is doing, for example, in different contexts, is around the training of um, of school-based uh, psychosocial support workers to help children within schools. Um, as well as uh, increasing our clinical support to um, children and adolescents with mental health psychosocial support needs um, but it's not I mean that there's such a range of interventions that fall into mental health and psychosocial support so for example in Myanmar for children coming out of armed forces out of the armed forces in Myanmar um, we are focusing on life skills as, as the key psychosocial support intervention for those children in, to, in support of their reintegration um, yeah, I mean, those are just a, a, few, a few examples. Okay, thank you. And, and um, uh, I was say, uh, Kelly or, or Mugdra, can, have you got a couple of examples? You know, practical terms to help people sort of really understand what we're talking about when we are talking about these kind of interventions. We have so many programs. Um, first of all, we have cognitive behavioural therapy delivered in schools um, and also in one-to-one -one settings, um, which often take a trauma-based approach, but not in terms of um, asking people to relive their experiences, but really to focus on behavioural activation. So by that, I mean supporting people who might be depressed or anxious to um, feel more able to cope with everyday life stresses. Um, we also had narrative exposure therapy, which did take uh, the approach whereby if people can get some mastery over their experiences, so for example, able to re-analyze um, their experiences um, through storytelling, um, that helps them to feel more able to cope. Um, in terms of the programmes in the process evaluations, we also um, had programmes which were focused at adult women in Rwanda. These were community counselling groups, um, which really was about people sharing their experiences and processing what, what has happened to them. Mutra um, might be able to add. Yes, um, additional for the um you know, trauma-focused uh, types of intervention in children, in particular, um, the program aimed to provide support uh, and improve skill and their caregivers by focusing on different strategy like, you know, um, cycle education advice, activities that give them opportunities to share experience or debate within the groups uh, setting, get life skills, education, and engage with other stakeholders like uh, teachers, school um, practitioners or parents, or within the wider community. So more focus on social activities and child center um, that extra to um, trauma-focused interventions. Thank you. What I'll do is I'll, I'll um, group them into threes and then invite you 
or to kind of comment on them as, as you feel um, feel best. So one question was, how important is the adaptation of methods and tools to local, social, and cultural realities? Another question was, is there any evidence emerging from the European humanitarian sort of refugee crisis um, about those in middle um, and low income country settings? So, you know, what's the difference between those that are arriving in Europe uh, as opposed to those in middle and low income country settings? Um, and is there any evidence um, for, uh, sorry, any evidence based psychosocial support interventions for children associated with armed forces and groups after they leave the militias? So, I don't know, maybe um, um, Kelly or Mukta, should we could turn to you first for any thoughts on those three questions? And I'll come to you, Catherine. Um, I can add on the, um, the evidence on the um, um, armed forces. Uh, the uh, evidence is quite limited. We found only two tries looking on the former child soldiers in Congo and Uganda. So, um, so yeah, pretty much very, very limited in terms of uh, study, look at the impact of intervention on these populations. Add to that, um, yeah, there was one study in the process evaluations which was about uh, mitigating um, child soldiering experiences of young boys in, in Mozambique and actually that linked to um, the need for um, cultural integration. So part of the programme was about engaging with the community um, through community sensitisation campaigns um, to, to support the local community to understand what uh, former child soldiers had experience and to understand how they could be reintegrated into the community. Thank you. Yeah, Catherine, no, no, it was, sorry, Catherine, are you one to? Sure. Um, just to reiterate, I think the, the evidence base uh, for children associated with armed groups, armed forces is very limited. And I know this is a concern for the Paris Principal Steering Groups and, and, and an area for potential further research. And there have been um, longitudinal studies on reintegration, as I think someone mentioned, the Mozambique study was mentioned. There's also been one in Burundi, um, but few that focus on evaluating interventions. Um, and I mean, anecdotal evidence indicates uh, that case-based support through case management is the most logical, complemented by life skills training and support um, to, in order to support reintegration. Would you, would you like a response to the other questions or? Yeah, please go on and then, then I'll come back to you next week, yeah. Sure. Um, so in terms of, uh, the European refugee crisis has been a, a really, really interesting and ri rich, complex and rich learning ground. Um, so it's a very complex context because a lot of unaccompanied separated children have exercised some agency in leaving and moving. They're crossing borders and resisting engagement with national protection systems. So um, the relative strength or perhaps the rigidity of the national systems has in some ways blocked appropriate responses or responses that are in the best interest of unaccompanied separated children who are choosing not to engage with them. Um, and added to this, this thinking particularly in Greece rather than Italy, um, but probably also relevant. So added to this, a uh, few amongst this group actually require family tracing, um, but they need support to understand, mitigate and manage the risks that are involved in their travel. And that it's complicated further by the diversity of um, countries of origin and uh, language barriers, which create barriers in communication and information sharing. I mean, something I would highlight is that UNICEF, UNHCR and IRC recently led a consultative process aimed at strengthening policies and practices relating to unaccompanied and separated children in Europe. So the document is called a, a Way Forward that highlights the need to identify children, register them through child-friendly procedures and build a relationship of trust with them as early as possible. Um, and ensuring that a well-trained guardian takes immediate responsibility for the child, engaging cultural mediators, mobilizing members of host communities as critical measures that can help build a trusting relationship and protect children from, from smugglers, traffickers. Um, so I think that's probably that consultative process and that, that document, The Way Forward, is probably the best um, learning that we have from that context. Yeah. 
Yeah, I cut you off unintentionally. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no worries. Um, I just want to mention about the adaptation of methods and tools to local social and cultural realities. Um, just to comment that on the, on the, from the over systematically, we found more than 100 tools, uh, mostly adapt to local context, um, or where they deliver a program evaluated, but um. Kelly might be uh, have more comments, but in terms of synthesis, it's posed some challenges in terms of how we're going to bring together different types of tools, different settings together to, you know, identify the impact from one um, intervention program. So just my comment on is, I think it's very important to get, uh, you know, the tools that um, can ex assess the impact of intervention in local context, but this have a you know implication in terms of evidence synthesis. Thank you. Yeah, so from the um we only found uh two studies that talked about this, but um when we looked at, so from the process of validation, from people's experiences of engaging in programs, two studies, people from two studies talked about the importance of um, engaging in uh, socially and culturally meaningful programs to them. But when we looked at the trials, we found that this was actually a, a key feature of all the programs, um, the majority of programs, sorry, uh, for children, and young people, um, and also for adults as well. And a common modification was programs that were originally developed in Western contexts were, were not culturally transferable, so therefore needed to be adapted. So this was usually around changing the, or adapting the uh, activities, so songs, games, local rituals to to reflect the local community, um, and also um, adapting psychological concept, uh, concepts um, with local cultural and spiritual beliefs about how to address mental health and psychosocial well-being. So the the, the language that people use um, in Western context um, doesn't trans doesn't translate basically and does need to be uh, adapted. Um, these uh, modifications were usually achieved by working with um, local communities, so uh, conducting focus groups with local facilitators. Um, and in addition to uh, culture, we're also taking into consideration the participants' characteristics such as age, gender, and educational levels. So, in some cases, I think in the in the process evaluation of uh, Guatemalan women, people were not literate, so they they didn't focus on written uh, written materials, like education, but more on movement and dance um, to support people express, um, you know, their internal world. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So there's, there's a few questions coming in, um, essentially around sort of efficacy and impact and, and sort of cost benefit. So um, one question is, what, what evidence exists of impact of child-friendly spaces on children's mental health? And you talked earlier about the, the lack of evidence around scales, but one of the questions is, what in your view are the most effective mental health interventions that could be implemented at scale during disasters? Um, and I suppose the, the, the opposite of that is, in, in context with very limited resources or very limited capacity, what does the evidence show about which of the interventions can be implemented? So I suppose is there, is there a distinction there between what you can do with very few resources and what you can do um, at scale? Um, yeah, and then does it make any difference about who provides it? Is it, is it government or NGO? Is there any significant uh, sort of difference in the evidence about who is the provider? So I've grouped a few questions there. Um, I hope that makes sense. Catherine, do you want to have a stab first at responding? Sure. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the child-friendly spaces, the evidence that exists, and I would encourage you to to look at the um, the outcomes of the the World Vision and Columbia University studies. Um, they're all online and there's a, a really wonderful two-page infographic, uh, which is one of the most accessible um, presentations of a uh, relatively large evidence base um, that, that I've seen. Um, so 
the this uh, it, they engage with with different agencies now as part of of this um, research process. Um, they uh, conducted six studies in five countries, so it's Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Iraq, and Jordan. I think there were two studies in Iraq or maybe Jordan, um, and it, it demonstrated some limited and very variable positive outcomes for psychosocial um, outcomes for children and protection outcomes for children, but it didn't demonstrate an impact on community engagement. So I think originally the researchers were looking, there are three at the three main objectives of um, CFS, which are promote psychosocial well-being, protect uh, you know, uh, protect children and engage communities. So some positive outcomes for psychosocial well-being and protection, none evident on community engagement, which I think uh, pushes us as practitioners to think differently about how we how we establish CFS. Um, it demonstrated a greater impact with girls than boys and a greater impact for younger children than older children. It also demonstrated the correlation between quality and the outcomes, uh, which I think was, uh, I think they developed a quality index based on the child protection minimum standards, which I thought it was heartening to, to the authors of that to see that they they got the standards correct, at least in the quality standards correct. Um, and that it really does have an income, um, an, an outcome rather. Um, they gave, it gave a strong indication of the need to contextualize child-friendly spaces, um, particularly thinking about urban locations and so on. Um, I think those are, those are the key findings, but I would direct you to have a look at, at that because it's it's a really interesting and informative um, research study. Thank you, uh, Mr. Or um, Kelly. So in terms of child-friendly spaces, there is a gap in the evidence, uh, qualitative evidence. So we didn't find any studies of children's experiences of, of these spaces. Um, and I think there's only one or two studies in our review. I'm looking at Mugdara. Um, yes, uh, actually, there are only in a trial, uh, we found one study comparing um, child-friendly spaces with trauma-based um, uh, CBT and uh, control groups um, on different types of interventions. Basically, in um, that PT um, evidence base is uh, show that um, child friendly space in this case is effective comparing to the control groups, but when comparing to the trauma-based um, intervention might be less effective. So again, the, the, there is a limitation in terms of child friendly space uh, evaluations try in our review. Can I, can I answer, just give a quite simple answer to the question about mental health uh, interventions at scale. I mean, for me, I think what you would start with is looking at building on, on some of the outcomes uh, from the MHPSS study, looking at who are the people who have a relationship of trust with the child, and then you look at how you build the skills of those people, not to be counsellors and psychologists, but to be able to pro provide guidance and some emotional support and referral if necessary. And those people logically are family parents, they are school staff, and they're child protection caseworkers. So that's that's what I would that's what I would focus on, and that the shape of that and the details of that will be will be according to context. Right, great, thank you. And and any thoughts on the one about where where you've got very constrained resources? You know, there, there are many emergencies which are out of the spotlight, and resources are hard to come by. Are there any that are sort of more effective when you've got less resource to, to throw at the problem? Um, well, on my end, uh, where there's constrained resources, I think you know I think there's a lot of a lot to be said for um, obviously good coordination. Or sometimes constrained resources can um, undermine that sort of coordination and collaboration. But we are strongest if we're working well together. And I think it's it's about um, ensuring. I think you can. Pr I would say that it is possible to mobilise more resources um, as well as work within the limitations we have. But I would I would emphasize sort of mobilizing more resources by doing better needs assessments, having better evidence 
evidence-based uh, program interventions which directly address the, the issues raised through the needs assessments and demonstrating the efficacy of the interventions that, that we that, that we undertake. I think those are the key things to, to build confidence in the sector to be able to, to leverage additional funding, as well as, I mean, I, I think another way is also to look at um, integration. So simple things at the moment, uh, cash-based programming is, is a, a huge area of growth across the humanitarian sector. Uh, we need to be much more savvy about looking at how we embed the, um, the measurement of child protection outcomes through cash-based programming and how we integrate, you know, indicate, you know, uh, in, uh, integrate into the, the monitoring and evaluation tools that cash have so that we're continually learning and improving um, and understanding the risks and the benefits to children through cash-based programming. So some of these are, are, are sort of key ways in which, uh, which we can reach more, ch more children. Nutrition is another one, and particularly for the mental health, psychosocial support side. Uh, nutrition is obviously a, a massive sector and one in which um, there's a lot of scope for increasing the emphasis um, on psychosocial support, particularly mo between mothers and infants, and ensuring that the follow-up and uh, family community-based support through integration with child protection. Great, thank you. And I wonder if you've, there was anything in the data about the long-term impacts of these interventions. So, um, you know, what happened for people over a longer period of time, you know, after having been participants in these, these kind of program interventions? And Kelly, look uh, at that, can I turn to you first? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a, as we said before, it's a real gap um, in our evidence base. Uh, most, you know, in children, I think we found only one study looking at uh, more than one year uh, post intervention. Most, most on average, um, is uh, about three to four months follow ups. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a challenge in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of resources um, on the ground and challenge in terms of um retaining both staff and participants um to follow up a longer terms um that that we we just came back actually from the who and uh mhpss meeting in geneva yesterday and there there are a lot of discussion of, around you know long term how we gonna improve not only you know program delivery but also look the way how to improve how we can assess the outcome at long gap we still i think it's still still on the debate at the moment but it's, it is um, something that we should work together to get uh, moving forward towards that end thank you Catherine, was there anything in, in your study that um, had that sort of longer term horizon? No, no, there wasn't actually. And uh, I mean, I think it, we do lack it somewhat in the humanitarian sector. I mean, I was just thinking the sort of um, the short term funding cycles we have, we still struggle. A lot of our indicators um, are not fully outcome focused enough. We're not thinking, not always, not always enough thinking at um, these the programmatic, long term strategic programmatic level outcomes more than the sort of uh, project based cycles, if you like. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm aware, I think uh, Kelly and Mukdarat mentioned this earlier about the longitudinal studies on reintegration uh, of children associated with armed groups and armed forces. Again, quite dated studies. I mean, the one that I'm most aware of is from, from Mozambique, uh, which did indicate, I think uh, stretching my memory back, it's been a while since I read it, that indicated actually good outcomes for reintegration, uh, social reintegration, livelihoods, and so on. In fact, even in some areas, some skills built, um, yet, yet uh, I think they were all, all men at this point, um, yet these men were still haunted by memories of their past.
sorry, I think my line just dropped there. I didn't quite catch the end, end of that. But, um, thank you. When I realised one of the questions earlier on was, was around who provides the service and whether that makes a difference. Did you see any difference between government-led uh, interventions or NGO-led interventions? Catherine or Kelly and Mutra, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, we had a bit of a blank. Um, yeah, just looking at the, at the sorry, <laughs> as a, yeah, just looking any, at the question. So, any thoughts there on, on the, the, the who matters? I think um, one of the key elements, it, well, there is a trend towards um, lay healthcare uh, providers, not not so much at different at different levels, didn't find data specifically on that, um, other than the importance of, of programs being able to in, um, get get government buy-in, um, but the most important element was that the, the providers felt that they were sufficiently trained to deliver the program. So whether they're lay providers originally or have a clinical background, but the importance of of ongoing su supervision, so that there is a need for support when delivering um, programs. Um, it seems to be that the there is a preference for for uh, working with people from the from the community, um, and that that being important to um, encourage people to access programs and to to stay engaged in those programs when when they are delivered um, by people by by uh, they don't lay providers. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Catherine, did you want to say anything on, on the who does it? Yeah. I mean, I don't have uh, profound, profound thoughts. I mean, uh, by the nature of humanitarian action, we're, we're generally uh, substituting, but we do for for governments and particularly in child protection, obviously working within a legal framework and trying to do our best to operate within that and support that and support the, the role of government within that. Um, and uh, I think you know, I think we have to be the object. What's the objective? Often, if I'm thinking about, us, for example, a case management program, um, the whilst we need to supplement capacity, um, the the objective is to, is to ultimately to build the capacity of the of the authorities to be able to take that on. Um, but we we have to also be realistic at, about um, the length of time that takes, and not not necessarily, and look at the ways in wh which we do that in order that the program continues to be effective and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all. Thank you. And, and you've got a couple of questions around um, and whether there's any evidence around, you know, things happening that people hadn't expected. And, and in particular, some people are asking, you know, where the providers are, are not necessarily, you know, fully trained or don't have real expertise in this area, uh, you know, have is there any evidence of, of you know things appearing that weren't expected, weren't wanted? Not from our review, no. I mean, when we when we looked at the trials, so um, to see how many, the majority are have been tra have been trained to so different degrees, as I said, different levels of, of training from one month, you know, to, to three months or ongoing training, but no. Catherine, anything new? No, I think, um, you know, I think in general, in child protection interventions in low and middle income countries, you're often, you're often um, practitioners um, are not always, but but often uh, may lack some some uh, knowledge and capacity. And so it, it's critical that the training and ongoing capacity building is built into program interventions. Um, I think that uh, in one of our studies on residential care, certainly that. Um, 
Wolf did a study in Eritrea of unaccompanied separated children in Eritrea. Uh, we found that that staff in residential care um, were better able to to meet the social emotional support needs of children um, once they had been trained than, than uh, before they had been trained essentially. Um, and again, in uh, the in Sierra Leone. Uh, the ongoing capacity building at, at all levels of children, communities, the responders, the government was absolutely critical to making that um, making that intervention success, that program successful. Uh, and at the same same time, uh, using a system building systems building approach. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to start um, drawing us to towards a close. I'd, I'd be interested in getting a few sort of concluding remarks from yourselves, um, and in particular whether you could share your thoughts on, on these two questions. What are the two things that practitioners and researchers can do to generate better evidence? And what's the one thing all of us can do to better disseminate and share this evidence? And certainly, you know, I'd be really interested in your thoughts on, on that latter question, because I think one of our our key issues is, is the evidence uptake. So um, I wonder if each of you could give a few thoughts on, on that, on those two questions. What are the two things practitioners and researchers can do to generate better evidence? And what's the one thing all of us can do to better disseminate and share this evidence? Um, look, George, shall I come to you first? Hi, it's Kelly. Um, <laughs> I think the, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we come as a package. <laughs> um, I think the, I guess from our, just from our experience of the WHO and ELRA meeting, the thing that is at the forefront of our mind is stakeholder engagement, both at the primary study level, um, so academics, researchers, NGOs and recipients um, all working together to produce uh, better relevant uh, appropriate evidence and then at the evidence synthesis level so for the systematic review level uh, a similar approach so we can develop um, a community of practice to really ensure that we are addressing the right questions this is my um, ideal situation thank you Great. And I think I think um, for on our side, uh, we had some recommendations from the evidence synthesis. I mean, for practitioners, uh, we'd want to recommend making simpler improvements to the quality of evaluation, such as description of methodology, uh, stating sample size uh, for family tracing and reunification, providing greater greater clarity on where where numbers indicate new cases um, and or cumulative cases and within what time frame and disaggregation. Um, I would also uh, recommend some standardization around of indicators and measures used to evaluate outcomes for children. That, I mean, as I mentioned before, it's not simple. Outcome indicators require long term perspective, which is undermined by short term funding cycles. But um, there should be a minimum time frame for the programming commitment to working with unaccompanied separated children. So it's important to define outcome indicators for the duration of the program. And we're also keen to that more. Um, program evaluations are made public. Um, so I'm involved with the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Um, in that forum, we've discussed having an annual award for the most informative failure, for example. Um, so we're certainly trying to encourage that. But as a, as a practitioner, the systematic review, it was, it was fascinating being part of this process. Um, and it raised questions for me about what constitutes evidence and what knowledge is valued. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that there is a wealth of knowledge that, that wasn't captured in the systematic review. Um, this is just one piece, an important piece of a broader knowledge base. So there's significant potential to address knowledge gaps through consultation with practitioners at different levels. Um, and in terms of generating and sharing evidence, I think well, particularly, um, again, through the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, we're very keen that uh, we we, sh we share a lot of evidence, but we need to do more to synthesize it, make it digestible um, and to encourage discussion around the implications of this for practice so that we're, we have a sort of a more dynamic sharing process. Um, I think that's something that we're, we're going to be looking at in the next year or two of um, particularly using the Alliance website as a, a space to 
synthesize and disseminate and encourage discussion, encourage discussion in different languages, uh, in different contexts and so on. So I think there's a lot of planning going on around that, but it's absolutely critical. And to encourage, as a forum also, just to encourage, you know, not just synthesize and, and disseminate, but critique and continue learning about the evidence. Great, good, thank you very much indeed. So I think that draws us to a close. Um, so thank you very much everybody for, for joining us and for your questions and, um, and and Catherine for, for presenting the information so clearly and concisely as, as well of course of doing all the, the work to produce the, the full reports. This webinar is going to be available on the Oxfam Policy and Practice website. Um, the next one is on Thursday the 12th of October at the same time, 2.30 British summer time. Um, we'll be looking at the impact of wash interventions in disease outbreaks and the impacts of market support interventions on household food security. Um, you can find the full series of humanitarian evidence program reviews, evidence briefs and webinars on the program websites. And you can see um, the links up on the, the screen there. So thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, I hope you found this interesting. Please do give us um, your feedback. We're, we're keen to learn about this as a process and um, look forward to doing this all again um, on Thursday as well. Thank you. Thank you.